we'll just end this last little chunk. Sacralization, this is when the L5 wants to become more like the sacrum. So here we can actually, we'll actually end up calling that segment S1 instead. So the L5 gets fused to the sacrum. More commonly, you have what's called lumbarization. This is when the S1 uh, doesn't fully connect and actually still has a, it has more of a disc between it and the sacrum. So you have an L6 vertebrae. Continuing right through the ribs and the sternum. Starting with ribs, we want to make sure that we identify what the different types of ribs are. We have three different groups that we have. We have true ribs. These are ribs that attach directly to the sternum. False ribs. They do not connect directly, but they go through the costal cartilage of the seventh rib. And then floating ribs. This is kind of a, a subset of false ribs. They are the ones that do not connect to the sternum at all. Depending on who is writing the board question, you can see false ribs being ribs 8 to 12, or you can see them 8 to 10. Eight Ribs 8 to 10 is the quote-unquote better answer for a lot of examinations because 11 and 12 have their own classification as floating ribs. Along with that kind of classification, we also have typical versus atypical ribs. The typical are three through nine. They have the gen same general structures. They have a head, a neck, a tubercle, a shaft, and a costal groove. A costal groove is where the nerve and the vessels run through um, <clears throat> along the posterior portion of the ribs. The inside portion of the ribs, I should say. The atypical ribs, these are ribs 1, 2, 10, and 11, and 12. Ribs 1 and 2 are pretty easy to see, especially rib 1. Rib 1 is much flatter, and it has these grooves for the subclavian vein and artery. Rib 2 is kind of in between the typical rib and um rib and, and the first rib so that's why it still gets kind of lumped in with all of that and we'll look at a couple we'll talk about a couple specific things on rib two in just a sec rib eight this is our typical rib right here and then 11 and 12 these are our atypical ribs um, because those are our floating ribs and these ones do not have a transverse costal facet that go along with them. They do not um, articulate with the TVPs of vertebrae 12 and 11 and 12. <clears throat> so we have the first rib. I mentioned the grooves for the subclavian vessels. It also is the attachment point for the anterior scalene and the middle scalene. Second rib has a rough tuberosity for the serratus anterior and a surface for the posterior scaling. If you're going to get a question about the first or the second rib, these things that are bolded, that's what you're going to get asked. Tenth rib, very, very unlikely that you'll ever get asked about the tenth rib, um, but it just has a single facet on the head for the T10 vertebrae. And then the eleventh and the twelfth rib it has the single facet on the head, no neck or tubercle, and no attachment to the sternum, which makes it that atypical rib. Um, there are some ligaments of the ribs. Un these are uncommonly asked. Um, we'll, we'll look at a couple of the, the most important ones. So the costo transverse ligament, again, when we look at ligaments, the names are going to be in there. So costo transverse ligament. Costo is rib, transverse, talking about the transverse process ligament. So between the rib and the transverse process. Costo transverse ligament right there from the rib to the superior TVP to the vertebrae, to the TVP of the vertebrae superior to it. 
There's, there's a lateral costo transverse ligament as well as a superior costo transverse ligament. We also have something called a radiate ligament, also known as the anterior costo vertebral ligament. It tells us right where it is. It's on the anterior side. I believe I had a picture of it here. Possibly not, but <clears throat> that's what it's from the rib, head of the rib to the vertebral body and the inter verte vertebral disc. Last one that they'll potentially ask about is the intraarticular ligament. This is from the rib head to the intervertebral disc. There's that intraarticular ligament connecting it right there to the IVD, the disc. Those are the main three. If you're ever going to get a rib question, those would be one of the three that you're going to get asked about. Low chance of getting asked about ligaments of the ribs. Um, so if you're going to spend your time memorizing something, don't spend a lot of time here. A uh, question that has popped up in the past, they like to ask about fractures, especially fractures of the rib, because as as chiropractors and when we're adjusting, um, so a lot of chiropractors will do rib adjustments. So the contact point for the rib adjustments is oftentimes in this general area between the neck, the tubercle, and the angle. This is the most common place for a fracture of the rib is at the angle of the rib. The sternum, the sternum is divided into three parts. We have the manubrium, which is here up at the top. It is then connected to the sternum at this location. We call this the sternal angle or the angle of Louis. Um, this will, this this specific point can be asked often. Um, sometimes they'll they'll ask more directly about in between the manubrium and the body. Or sometimes they will ask a question related to the jugular vein, the um, external jugular vein. Um, this is more of the, on the side of pathology, where when we are measuring the height of the jugular vein to see if we are worried about congestive heart failure, we measure from the angle of Louis, from this sternal angle. With the manubrium, we have up here the jugular notch as well as the clavicular notch. The clavicle connects right in there. And then ribs one and two connect to the manubrium. <clears throat> so if you anybody, the, the question gets asked, how many ribs articulate with the manubrium? Remember, we have to remember both sides. One, two for the first rib, three, four total ribs for first and second rib. And second rib comes and connects right here at that angle, so it's half on the manubrium, half on the sternum. Or I should say the body of the sternum. The body, it has a couple of AKAs. It's either the body, the gladiolus, or the corpus. All of those are, are AKAs for the body portion of <clears throat> the sternum. Finally, the last little tippy-tip point, that is the xiphoid process. There's a little joint here we call it the xiphosternal joint. There is minimal movement right there. Uh, and later on, we'll, we'll see some more about the articulation. So we'll look at the specific um, articulations of the clavicle and some other things that connect into the sternum. Development. We have already seen this exact chart. So this table, this chart right here, you absolutely just, you need to know this super well. There's going to be, if I had to put a number on it, I would say you're going to have three to seven questions just on the information that is found in this table, okay? It's going to be what germ layer is it from, what's the subgroup, what structure, something along those lines. The ones that are highlighted are the most commonly asked. So that's why we we really, really, really need to know this entire table. So um, as I as I continue to develop new new study tools, I will look into making sure I develop a specific study tool just for this um, table specifically. 
to make sure that we really, really, really understand this and make sure that we have this down really well. A couple of extras, um, talking about connecting a little bit to our pathology with the central nervous system pathology from the neural tube formation, so forming of the actual spinal cord. The condition spina bifida occulta. Occulta means hidden. The opposite of occulta is manifesta, because either it's occult, it's hidden, or it is manifested, it is visible. So spina bifida occulta, this is when the lamina of the vertebrae fuse to fail. We can have an absence of a spinous process. Oftentimes you will get a small tuft of hair. We call that a fawn's beard growing at that specific site. This is something that as chiropractors, we want to make sure that we look out for because if we go pushing and poking into that segment, there is no bony protection. And so we can potentially just poke and squish right into the spinal cord, which is a big, would be a big, big mistake. We, do not, we want to make sure that we do not do anything like that. From the spina bifida occulta, just the absence of the lamina, we take it a step further and we call it a meningocele. Meningocele, this is the meninges, so the mater, the dura pia mater, that kind of stuff. This is an extension of those. It looks almost like a little cyst. It's just filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Um, this is a surgical case. They go in and they they seal it off and, and drain. They drain this little, little chunk and they seal it off to make sure that um, we do not damage the spinal cord at all. We continue to take it a step further. We have a myelocele. Myelocele is when you have the spinal cord protruding out from the undeveloped meninges. Um, if we have these, we have these both happening at the same time. We'll call that a meningomyelocele. Um, that is both the meninges and the spinal cord protruding out. Additionally, we have two other conditions. We have an Arnold Chiari syndrome. We have type 1 and type 2. Type 1, the cerebellar peduncles. So here's the cerebellum right here. Basically, the cerebellum is down a little too far and gets squished with the brainstem. So that's our, our Arnold Chiari 1, type 1 malformation. Type 2 is the same thing as type 1. But plus, we also have a meningomyelocele somewhere in the spine, typically in the lumbar spine. Cleft palate, this is another failure of development of the neural tube. We have failure of the maxillary and the palatine bones to fuse together. This is also often seen with some of our trisomy type disorders. Um, I know for a fact trisomy 21, or tr sorry, trisomy 13 is a big one that tends to have a cleft palate. Uh, I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head right now with those other ones. In the pathology portion, we'll, we'll take a look, and if any of them have mentioned a cleft palate, I'll make sure to point that out. Finally, last one, anencephaly. This is the absence of a major portion of the brain, skull, and scalp. This is one of the most severe cases. This is essentially the, the entire top of the brain, the entire... Um, cerebrum of the brain did not develop so it was left open it did not develop <clears throat> so you have ba like you have some cerebellum and you have um brain stem activity so this individual um can still you know breathe a little bit it's they're not super well they often do not last um, do not survive very long outside of the womb however <clears throat> Um, this is a condition where, you know, they're going to be born absent and missing that top portion of the brain. Uh, a quick note with all of this, all of these conditions, we talk about, high, unless there's a, a super clear answer asking, like, what is this condition? And it, it's asking for a definition. For anything that's related to that central nervous system issues anything like like this these conditions specifically we always lean toward hypovitaminosis b 
B vitamins are incredibly important in the early stages of central nervous system development. So if we have any of these issues, we point towards vitamin B deficiency being a potential cause. Most commonly, B9 is the biggest one, aka folic acid, aka methylfolate, aka tetrahydrofolate, aka MTHE, THFR, um, which is metho methylated tetrahydrofolate reductase. So any of those, like that's what we're looking for in an answer for cause of neural tube defects. This one's getting a little bit long, but we're going to, I'm going to do the specific development in the next video. So we will go ahead and, and look at that momentarily.